Okay, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers. Mary Lou, thank you very much for the organizing. It's been amazing. And to Ruben for the generosity for allowing us to be present here at this meeting. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few people working on the project. Um, Kerry, especially for the work that he's doing on the multi locus sequencing and the, uh, the, the, phylo the phylogeny or the, the fungi that we are working on at the moment. Okay, uh, before I go on to the, the host that is predominantly affected in Israel, that's avocado. Uh, Svi has shown some of the other hosts that are affected, and the one is what you've seen yesterday, that's the California box elder. Castor oil, Svi showed symptoms, oak you saw, and avocado. So some of the symptoms you saw already in some of Svi's slides, and uh, uh, you'll probably see more tomorrow. But in effect, this is the situation in a, a mature orchard which is affected. Um, you do get mortality of trees. Usually, uh, a farmer won't allow his field to get to a situation like this because a field like that is non-productive. Um, but for experimental purposes, we are allowed to, to let a situation like this uh, arise. Um, damage as such, broken branches, uh, is very common. It's probably due to the, the excessive boring of the beetle and then the mechanical weight of the yield that just breaks those branches. Uh, again, you see here um, loss of yield, premature drop of the fruit. Young trees also affected, and we notice at the base of the, of, of the stems of these trees, four to five year old trees, due probably to the microclimate of the humidity, the moisture, and the shade. So the beetle can develop here, and usually only at the base of these young trees. But uh, we, we don't know what the future of these trees uh, hold. I presume that this orchard will eventually um, uh, be, be uh, um, killed uh, due to the, the massive uh, infection of the fungus, which appears already at this early stage. Um, this you saw earlier on, the <coughs> development of the galleries in infected tissue. And what I'd just like to show you is where the fungus is situated in the stems. Um, when you peel back that bark, you actually uh, see healthy tissue. However, as you go further on, you see that the fungus has started to develop within the, the xylem. And as such, the necrosis is very, very, uh, um, it's, it's uh, easily observed. And again, when you um, look at it closely, the, the xylem is completely colonized by the fungus. Okay, again, what you saw earlier on, infected uh, maple is very, very susceptible to the pathogen. Here again, the infections within the, the xylem. Uh, castor bean, you saw that as well. Again, absolutely, um, infected with uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, pock marks and the beetle develops here, the fungus develops and you get mortality of the tree. So, so all these hosts end up in tree mortality. Um, again, infection and in oak, we have backyard oaks that are infected. This is not yet a phenomenon uh, widespread in Israel. Um, Again, close-ups of some of the pictures you saw early on. Okay, I'd now I'd like to move on to the, the obligate nature of the fungus uh, beetle situation that we've encountered. And I stress obligate symbiosis because uh, this is the case. Uh, when you crush the heads of the beetle, here you see uh, typical sp uh, spores 
sorry, typical uh, fungal spores, which are fusarium spores, and isolated. Uh, this is what they look like. Um, and I'd just like to stress that fusarium is not a common symbiont of ambrosia beetle, beetles. However, it has been reported. And in this case, uh, Kerry um, did the phylogeny for us with his multilocal sequencing of, uh, of four um, uh, genes as such. And you can see it's very closely related. Uh, Sorry, this is, uh, uh, as you can see, very closely related to Fusarium ambrosium. Um, we're collaborating now with uh, research in Japan to, to characterize our fungus and name it, because at the moment it's Fusarium species nov, and obviously that's unacceptable, so we have to get to the stage where we can actually name it. Uh, so this is ongoing work, and uh, we should get there soon. Okay, so in our collection at the moment, we have around 150 isolates or more. Uh, isolates from, sorry, from avocado, avocado beetles, dead and alive, from Asa nagunda, from calcastabine, from oak. We also have, interestingly, Isolates from persimmon, which we consider non-host because the beetle will attack persimmon. <coughs> However, the fungus cannot establish itself. Therefore, the life cycle of the beetle uh, cannot uh, reproduce. So, so we are able to isolate the fungus, but it cannot uh, colonize under these uh, conditions. So just looking at the genetic diversity of our population of Fusarium isolated from, from all our hosts and beetles, live and dead, we use uh, arbitrary prime PCR. Um, and we get very uniform banding patterns, just to take you through some of, uh, some of these uh, uh, lanes. You have from beetles, from Haas avocado from Ettinger, also Haas beetles, Haas. And this is just an, a representative out, out group, Fusarium mangifera from mango. Um, again, another, another primer. Um, Soli beetles. Okay. Here we have, again, a different, uh, different uh, primer set. Um, again, looking at, at different sources of our isolates from beetles from avocado, galleries, larva from avocado, avocado itself. So again, very uniform. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, alternative banding patterns. So, so it appears that we are really working with a clonal population here. Uh, again, this is, becomes boring, but uh, just show you that we have trapped sterilized beetles, trapped non-sterilized beetles from persimmon as well, which is our non-host, and from, uh, from the Acer. Again, very uniform banding patterns indicating that uh, we have a clonal population. Okay, just looking at the, the, the biology of the pathogen, there's no real restriction here because uh, the pathogen basically uh, will germinate and its optimal temperatures are above 15, 20 degrees and all the way through to 30, uh, 30 mm -hmm. odd. So this is a wide temperature range. So the, basically the fungus can develop throughout the year, although during the winter it will probably grow slower, but uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not restricted by our temperature ranges in Israel. Uh, we conducted Koch postulates only with the fungus to determine whether we are working with a true pathogen or not. Um, so we used four different isolates from different sources, and when I mean different sources, from different locations in Israel, from avocado and from beetles. Um, here you have here you have one, two, three, and four, four different isolates. Here you have the control, our control, which is just mock inoculation. Uh, six weeks later, you can actually start seeing the necrosis as you peel back that bark. And 
six months thereafter, you can see the necrosis has started to develop even further. And 11 months or close to a year later, we see that, that the fungus has progressed approximately 10 centimeters in each direction of the inoculation point. So the fungus itself is moving, although slowly, without the presence of the beetle. So it doesn't really need the beetle, but the, apparently the pace of spread is much slower uh, without the presence of the beetle. Um, and this just shows you again, this is where the inoculation was conducted and, and these branches were killed by the fungus which eventually caused uh, some kind of uh, uh, occlusion there and, and a wilting effect uh, in the long term. It took us about a year to get these completely um, uh, wilted symptoms and, and branch death. Okay, turning now onto a detached method, we were also able to, to reproduce symptoms on detached wood which we inoculated. Um, nothing really spectacular there. And in plants in the greenhouse, the story is completely different. Uh, these are about a year and a half grafted uh, house seedlings which we inoculated along the stems, and what we see here are typical versatile <coughs> exudation, the sugar exudations here in the inoculated as opposed to control. However, two months later, and we conducted this uh, with a multitude of infections along the stems, distances of either four or 10 centimeters distance, uh, the tree re st still remains alive and you cannot see very much uh, uh, damage to the inoculated tree. So here you have again sections uh, as such, control and inoculated. So these trees do not show external symptoms. The fungus appears to colonize, but at a very, very slow pace. We're able to isolate the fusarium, though. The fusarium is still alive and active. OK, similar tests were done on shoots, vegetative shoots. And again, you, you see the control as opposed to the fusarium infection. However, these shoots will remain symptomless. You'll not see any wilting or any such uh, effect of the presence of the fungus. You can also do uh, a wound inoculation with a scalpel and agar discs and you also do not see any, uh, any um, uh, wilting as such. So we can call our fusarium a minor pathogen perhaps, but it's not a typical pathogen as we see with Botryosphaeria or with Raphaelia as uh, Rusty, uh, Randy uh, has reported in his work. Uh, just to go very fast through the next slides, this is the growth of the fungus and the, uh, the larvae consuming. Uh, these are galleries which you saw. Now when we plate the beetle from our source uh, on our fungus. You can see that it reproduces very well. However, when you plate the beetle from Sri Lankan source, you can see that it just about uh, cannot survive and dies. So indeed, we have a very, very specific interaction here. Uh, vice versa takes place when you place, uh, when, when you try and cultivate the beetle from Sri Lankan source on, on the uh, Israeli, fungus as well as when you take the fungus from Israel and <laughs> um, okay so now looking further ahead at what happens when you use the different uh, fornicatus larvae from Israel on different fusaria sources um, 
you can see here the pupation uh, only allows uh, on a feed of fusarium number of larvae, number of larvae that survive only from fornicatus um, remain at 20 when they fed, whereas the others uh, start uh, uh, dying in time. Again, the same picture on the, at the second instar stage and at the third instar stage. So just to summarize, uh, in general, we can say that our fusarium from avocado is vectored in the mycangium. It's not a typical pathogen as compared to Raphaelia and Botryosphaeria. Uh, it develops successfully on fusarium but not on other associated fusaria. It appears to be clonal. We don't find any um, uh, <coughs> differentiation. Everything is uniform as far as uh, banding patterns goes. And um, it does not develop on non-host trees. There are non-host trees which do not show symptoms. So there does seem to be some sort of attraction here and repellence and the fusarium from avocado is specific to the avocado beetle as uh, we've seen that the tea beetle for instance cannot develop on our source of fusarium so questions i'll leave for later um, and just future results uh, future uh, research will uh, look at the interactions as we have uh, GFP label, label strains now and we'll be looking at the interaction between our fungus and the other related fungi in the mycangium and why the, our beetle cannot survive on the other uh, fungi that is fed. Uh, looking at specificity, specificity of the beetle to other botanical hosts and determine specificity of the fungal attraction to the beetle and finally control strategies which we are working on at the moment. Thanks. <laughs>